right, so I'm just gonna move the Zoom controls a wee bit. Always hate moving these controls because you have to somehow click right in between yeah. the buttons in order to move them. The buttons. Exactly, you can't push the button. And my microphone is in fact on. Yes, okay, if anybody can't hear, please feel free to message. Adam will see it and he will let me know. Mm -hmm. That I'm either not speaking loud enough, which is somewhat inconceivable, or uh, there's something wrong. Thank you. So we're going to get into modeling in 3D. Modeling in 3D is probably, um, in my profession as an industrial designer, it's probably one of the most common tasks that I do as part of my work designing products, but um, also in terms of interfacing with machines with more complexity than just the 2D objects we've been working with. Um, 3D modeling is almost mandatory to help you learn how to lay things out and to also help tell machines what you want to do in that all too tricky third dimension. Okay. Okay, so today's topics, we're going to be uh, going through essentially software options. We will talk and kind of cover briefly Tinkercad and Fusion 360, which is what Adam demonstrated just a few moments ago. Um, and we'll start getting into the basics of drawing in three dimensions, which, as you can imagine, compared to 2D, it just adds that lovely third C axis to everything. And we'll also go over a few um, advanced and alternative uh, strategies and concepts around 3D modeling to kind of prime your brains to sort of realizing how useful these tools are uh, going forward. So the thing is, when it comes to three-dimensional software, there is no limit to your imagination of what's out there. There are even more than what's listed here. Some of these I've never even heard of before, like Antimony, never heard of that one before. But um, all of them are great and they have specific uses, specific use cases that are the best. So for instance, Fusion 360 is actually very similar to SolidWorks um, and Tinkercad to an extent, and also Onshape and OpenSCAD. Like they're all uh, essentially solid modeling tools. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of detail of what that is. Um, but for instance, oh, and so they are great for general product design and manufacture, figuring out how to make things in three dimensions, simulating simple uh, assemblies with those objects you design. But then, for instance, you have things like ZBrush uh, right up here, the one with the cool Z logo, that one, and Maya, uh, and even Unreal and Unity as well, are very much favored by artists because they opt to simulate more what it's like to sculpt something and are really good at capturing fine organic detail. Anybody who is a professional making different sculptures and stuff like that will use tools like Maya and ZBrush and the like. In fact, I have a friend who worked for McFarland Toys for a little while, and he was really good at creating like fictitious anatomy of different monsters and animals. And he could like draw their skeleton and put flesh on it and stuff. He used ZBrush all the time. And it was pretty cool what he could make. Um, but then, of course, there are other types of solid modeling programs like Fusion and SolidWorks, particularly have things like Inventor, which is actually kind of just like a slight different version of kind of like Fusion 360. Revit, for instance, you can see the R symbol there. That's actually an architectural program. Architects like to use Revit and also some architects that use Rhino as well, although a lot of designers prefer it too. But both of those programs are good at handling big 3D models. Like if you want to model a whole city block, they are really good at putting those together and allowing you to create a very accurate site plan that you can design over. Um, tools like Blender are best at actually creating really good texture mapping. So if you want to take a 3D model and make it and render it, that is make it look very photorealistic, uh, Blender is a great tool to use in that case. Um, and again, every single one basically has certain things it's best at. Slide is very slowly changing. Very uh, this one, yeah. So three specific types of design tools. I mean, generally they fall into these categories. So um, you have Sketch and Extrude, very very common, uh, used a lot. Comes from engineering design. Some of the first ones to use it are actually it's a 
program called Pro Engineer was the one to really popularize that system of creating stuff, sketches to extrusions and the like. Um, volumetric and 3D mesh, they kind of, again, fall to different spaces. So 3D mesh would be like I was mentioning with um, Maya and ZBrush. And volumetric is kind of like what you'd see in Rhino, where it's like creating just these large volumes of surfaces that define three-dimensional space. They tend to be a lot faster than the other two systems, but they tend to have a little bit less um, actual information in their modeling tools. Uh, again, not hard and fast rules between all the three differences. Um, it's just it's optimizing for different use cases. So obviously, 3D mesh is going to be great for sculptors. Sketch and extrude, good for product makers. Volumetric is also great for creating very large scale objects. Um, particularly because when it's volumetric, it just worries about how big it is, not all the stuff in it, like you would with uh, sketch and extrude and 3D mesh. Um, so for today, we're going to be covering uh, Tinkercad, which is a beginner tool. It is very straightforward, very simple, and free online, which is also a fantastic bonus. Then we'll also talk a little bit about its bigger brother, Fusion 360. Both of them are Autodesk products. If you may have heard AutoCAD, those are, that's Autodesk. Those are those people. Um, Fusion 360 is going to be a little bit more advanced. It's going to have more sophisticated tools. We'll be covering it, but it does have a bit of a steeper learning curve. So just realize it's going to be spending a lot of time with it, getting used to it. And what I like to say, it's understanding the metaphor of the program. When it comes to 3D modeling, there is a metaphor. Most software follows some form of metaphor. Like you ever wonder why we call it Windows? Because they got the idea of looking through a window to see something. Like it's, it's the metaphor that they're following to create that sort of file system. Same thing with these. They will have a particular metaphor that helps you understand how you're manipulating objects in 3D space. Um, I may also be able to, time permitting, to talk a little bit about Onshape and SolidWorks. SolidWorks is the program I use all the time. It's my favorite. I love it. I've been using it for like 20 years. It's fantastic. It's gotten me out of many jams. So I tend to be a bit biased when I talk about it. Uh, um, but depending on how much time we have, I may be able to demo it. But uh, that is what's cool about that. SolidWorks is an insanely expensive program, but also insanely powerful. What's great is when you are a Make Haven member, you can access it for free on your home computer, which is very cool. Um, and Onshape, which again is actually very similar to Fusion 360 um, and is pretty powerful. I was playing with it a little bit. It's a little chuggy for me today. I don't know if they have a lot of users today going on or something, but that's kind of the issue you have with a lot of um, online app-based 3D modeling is that depending on your internet speeds and depending on their traffic, they can get a little slower and hard to use. Something to keep in mind. Um, but uh, for right now, we've got Tinkercad. Again, I've trained kids how to use Tinkercad. It, it's a very straightforward, very simple program. And so the way it works is um, you basically have this layout here. Um, like all um, Autodesk programs, they incorporate, you see uh, what's labeled here, the view cube. That's like Autodesk's proprietary view control system they've been pushing for a very long time. And it's basically a cube that you can click and drag. And basically what you're looking at on that cube is how you see the world around you. So if you can see the actual blue work area is at the same angle as that cube. As I click and drag on it, it will move the cube and move the view in space. But I can also click on the faces and get an orthographic view of that face. So um, there's a few different words I may throw out there, three of them being a perspective view, an orthographic view, and an isometric view. So orthographic view means a flat on view with no perspective applied, pure 2D. It's just a flat view of something. Uh, orthographic basically means like one, one size for everything. Isometric is again adding a third dimension to orthographic. And it is still no perspective applied, but adds a Z axis of the same dimension as the X and Y. It's very commonly used in engineering diagrams. For most uh, Autodesk software, they kind of play a little fast and loose with what that looks like. 
this image right here we're looking at is actually in a perspective view where um, in, a, in a true orthographic view, you wouldn't notice this tapering effect. A true orthographic view would almost appear to be like a perfect cube, no matter how you rotated it. Whereas in this one, you can see there's a vanishing point in the distance. A perspective view is not the best for measuring objects or understanding precisely how they're oriented in space, um, but it is really good at understanding how it might look once it's made. So it's kind of like a best of both or here in Tinkercad, you can have good orthographic views and excellent perspective views to help you see what you're making. Um, you simply switch between them, like I mentioned. The home view button is basically the first view that the browser was opened in. When you hit that home button, it will return to that. Um, then over here, you can see there are context-specific tools, which only become available when you have the right conditions met. And then, of course, you have the sidebar here which incorporates all the different basic shapes built into Tinkercad. Um, Tinkercad's metaphor is essentially positive and negative space. Okay, So the way you create something, and I'll demo this in a moment, the way you create something is essentially taking an object, and then you can make another object, but they have an additional property. The objects can be said to be a solid object or a whole object. H-O-L-E, meaning that when you combine the objects, the whole object will cut away from the solid object, allowing you to turn that new object into a hybrid of the two forms from before. Or if both objects are set to solid and you join them together, they will form a new combined solid that is twice the volume and size. You can't combine two whole entities because you're subtracting nothing from nothing, which is nothing. So you can't do that. Um, that's a question. That's yes. The, the whole, that's when they're two separate things and they keep the original property. So like a rectangle and a triangle together, you still see the rectangle and a triangle. You won't see the rectangle anymore, but you will see a rectangle cut out of a triangle. I'll, I'll demonstrate that because I think, if I'm not mistaken, the, 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 yeah, uh, the uh, GIFs were not loading properly when I checked the presentation earlier today. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to uh, demo Tinkercad right here live. Because it's that awesome. So right now, and if anybody can't see it, just let me know. But everybody here should be able to see it pretty easily. The advantages of showing up in person. So basically, um, with Tinkercad, all you have to do is create a profile like I did, um, and you would kind of get this um, cool uh, home page here, which kind of talks about things you've been doing. Uh, you can see here what's actually really cool about Tinkercad. Not only can we do 3D objects, you can see a previous class I did. Um, but you can also do stuff like simulate circuits and also use code blocks to interact with them, which is pretty cool if you are so inclined to demonstrate that. But I'm going to create a new design. And you will see in a moment the world of Tinkercad. IP crunk. Yeah, it's, uh, that's one thing Tinkercad does. Uh, <laughs> Adam just noticed it. It randomly assigns a name to a file you create if you don't specify one. You begin. So I'll use this to go over um, a lot of the stuff we just talked about and then kind of get into some of the more specific stuff too. So first things first, um, like I mentioned, here's that cool cube. If I click and drag, it changes my view. Probably going to be a little chuggy, and I'm not sure if people online will get it as clear as we get here. But you can see how I can move it. But then if I click on it, you can see I'm actually seeing the infinitely small edge of the work plane. But let's say I want to actually look down on it. I can, sh I can see that what this cube is telling me is that the work plane, I would see it if I was orthographically viewing from the top. And if I click on there, I see the top of the work plan. I can see this entire grid. Other things to note, you can see down here in this bottom corner, 
settings basically allows you to set different aspects of what you're working on. Zoom speed, showing a grid, showing shadows, background colors, units that are used. Um, you don't necessarily have to play with those unless they are uh, giving you some difficulty. Most STL files tend to assume you're going to be exporting in millimeters. Um, so keep that in mind if you want to work in inches. Um, but most CAD programs, even if you type in inches, will be able to do the conversion to millimeters for you. Or you just get used to working in millimeters. I don't know. You can give your work a great European flair. One thing you can do, I'll just let that sink in for a sec. Okay, we'll move on. Nobody likes millimeters jokes. Um, anyway, <laughs> see, I'm professional. I can just move on from failure. Um, moving on, two important buttons that we're going to want to see. I know. It's nobody, nobody respects it. I get it. You know, it's painful. <laughs> um, if you have 3D models, for instance, there are hundreds of resources online to find excellent 3D models that you can import to um, Tinkercad. Um, basically, it has to be an STL, OBG, or SVG. That should perk the ears of everybody who's been following us with uh, 2D design. So you can import 2D artwork into Tinkercad, and it will be able to um, uh, acknowledge it and allow you to use it. Uh, .obg is another, obj, excuse me, is a, uh, another type of three-dimensional uh, program transfer format. It's one of the pretty popular ones, especially for artist programs. And STL, again, if well, when we covered uh, 3D printing, that's the primary exchange format used for 3D printing. And Tinkercad allows you to use it as well. When you export, it's the same idea. It will pretty much be able to uh, export into .obj, STL, or GLTF, which I'm not super familiar with. Um, it might be an Autodesk-specific um, export format. Or you can also export SVG for laser cutting. So keep that in mind. Um, you can see that it obviously is empty, so there's nothing to export. But since uh, Autodesk Fusion 360 is, again, quite literally the big brother of Tinkercad, I can export my Tinkercad stuff and just migrate it over to Fusion if I've started to become more familiar with that more advanced program. Um, you can see here, we can play around with adding work planes, manipulating them. Uh, we can also measure objects. And if we're collaborating with others, we can add notes to the space. So what I first want to do is kind of mention what I had discussed before about the primary metaphor of Tinkercad. So I'm just going to create a slightly more appealing view. And then I'm going to go ahead and drag this box shape out into space. Now, things to note, um, if you hold C, it will snap it down to the work plane. Right now, because there's nothing else there, nothing to snap to, it is just snapping to it on its own. That's what that little uh, circle is denoting down there. And so I can see that when I let go, it has created that box object. And if I rotate my view, I can see that it is, in fact, on the ground there. And I can double check by actually clicking on the front. And I can see that it is, in fact, resting on the ground. So you'll also notice that when the box came up, it's in solid mode. I can also change it to whole mode, where it creates this, what's called a zebra stripe pattern on it, also makes it transparent. But for right now, let's stay with solids. We can change its color here or make it semi-transparent. For right now, we'll leave it as is. And you can see we have a few slider controls here. Uh, radius allows you to add a radius to all corners equally. This radius in more sophisticated modeling programs is actually called a fillet, spelled exactly like fillet, but it's fillet. It's like the Luthier discussion of before. Sometimes the French pronunciation is not used. Take your millimeters. <laughs> <laughs> fillet. <laughs> yeah. Um, the steps slider actually just controls, I believe, the subdivisions of the object. Generally, um, you don't have to play around with it too much. Is that 10 original? Then you can see here length, width, and height. As I move these sliders, it actually controls those dimensions, and it tells me the number 
that I'm altering it to, but I can also type a number into it. Additionally, I can control its height as well. So you can see I can actually use these controls to create um, the object that I would like, but, and I'm using my uh, mouse's scroll wheel to zoom out. I also should make a note here. Uh, when it comes to 3D modeling, uh, less so with 2D CAD, when you get to 3D CAD, pretty much always use a mouse. It is possible to use these things with trackpad and touchpad. Uh, they are built and are more e efficient when you use a mouse. Um, just something that I've found from my years of playing around with this stuff. One thing to note, let's say I love the size of this, um, this uh, giant box I've made, but I might want to alter it a little bit. So any of these little boxes on here are exactly the same as the slider. So if I click and drag, I'm actually altering the shape. And again, it's telling me what I'm altering it to. I can also click on this, type in a number, and hit enter. You want to change it. Here. Ah, okay. um, next thing I can do, let's say I want to actually move the object. The little cone here, if I click and drag on that, it actually moves the object up a set amount. You can see the number altering right there in the corner. And it's telling me up at the top how high it's getting as well, because the dimension is obscured. But let's say I liked it better on the ground, just a good old fashioned control Z or uh, command Z if you're on Mac to return it back, just like any other program. Uh, again, these little cubes here are the same thing as length and width editing. I click and drag and I edit the length and width on the fly. But the black squares allow me to drag it. Actually, that allows me to extrude it. So I bet you I have to do this. Oh, you can just click and drag. So if I want to actually change its positioning, this cone, like I said, moves it up and down, but simply clicking and dragging will uh, also move it around space. This is where I'm talking about playing across many different metaphors. I've used a lot of different programs, and all of them have slightly different rules on how you want to edit and change stuff. So. Sometimes I kind of cross strings a little bit with what I remember from some of them. But again, feel free to ask questions. You can see these little curved arrows. If I click and drag on those, you can see the protractor pop up and I can rotate them a specified degree in either, in any axis direction. Just note, you can see how the protractor is perpendicular to an axis. And even the selection box is always flat on this ground. You are always rotating it relative to the coordinate system of the work plane. In some CAD programs, when you alter a shape's position, you can only rotate it based on the, sh the shape's current axis. But in this case, the axis is always re relative to the work plane. As I mentioned before, there are, of course, two different modes. So one thing I can do, because I like this box, I'm going to go ahead and lock it because I like this. I don't want to be able to change it. Let's say I want to in the future, I can always unlock it and all the editing tools open back up to me. But for now, I'm going to lock it because what I want to do is I'm going to show you how a whole object works. So you can see that there are some whole objects already set here that you can just click and drag out. But again, any solid object can turn into a whole object. And as you can see, if I drag out and I'm still holding the mouse button down, that little circle is showing me, oh, it wants to snap it to the sides of the box. I'd actually rather have it onto the ground. So I'm holding C and it is snapping it to the ground for me. Let go, that accepts the object. So what I'm going to do is, I'm actually probably going to leave it that diameter, but I'm going to go ahead and stretch it a bit, if it'll let me. Come on. You can do it, buddy. There we go. All right. So I've made it a little bit taller, 
then the box, rotate my view. I'm actually going to go ahead and drag my box, drag it into the box, the cylinder that I just made. And now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to turn the cylinder into a hole. Now, if I hold shift and select both objects, it says I have two shapes selected. Select both shapes. We got just one. This is what I mean with using uh, browser tools. Tend to just be a little bit slower. Oh, I know what I got to do. Come on. So if I want to cut into the box, I need to unlock my box so that it will accept edits. I'm going to move this cylinder. I don't know. It, honestly, at this point, I'm moving it just to a place that I think would be the coolest cut. And again, hold shift, select both. And what I'm able to do, uh, you can see this context specific um, action come up called group. I group them. The whole object has disappeared. And I'm left with a hole sliced into my box the whole object removed from the box its exact shape. What's nice about Tinkercad and also somewhat limiting about Tinkercad is that since my cuts are based on grouping objects, you start nesting different groups together. It can get a little confusing trying to keep track of all the groups that create your shapes because what I can always do is I can ungroup it and I've got my whole object back. And again, let's say I convert this to a solid object once more and combine them. Now, instead of removing the material, it has joined them together into one object. I also have the ability to mirror the object. And you can see basically showing me a preview of how it's going to get mirrored. If I do a vertical mirror, horizontal mirror, or uh, vertical, like a just X or Y mirror and vertical. And if I like it, I can just double click it and I accept mirroring it in that direction. And again, what's cool is I can also still ungroup the object. So now they're in their mirrored positions but ungrouped. I can also choose to align them in a very specific manner using the align tool. And this basically allows, this just shows you different previews of how I can align them, align them by corners, by the bottom of the object. You know, I can, always, I can choose where I actually want their orientation to be aligned. So I can choose center. So now they're, uh, the center in this direction and of the box and the cylinder are now on the same point because I chose that axis and the center of it. Again, uh, showing how alignment works. Again, it's showing me all these different preview points, the center of a certain axis or the edge of a certain axis. And then by double clicking, I pick where it moves to. So now it's actually centered in two directions on that box. What's also pretty cool is the text tool. Now I've had a little bit of luck with the text tool. Sometimes it likes to cooperate. Basically, you just enter any text you want in this box. And I say uh, I've been somewhat unlucky. Last time I demonstrated this, it just refused to change the text in the 3D model, but it looks like now I have a little bit more luck. Uh, you can change the fonts. There's a few preset fonts, nothing too fancy. Um, honestly, you could probably import um, an SVG file of more sophisticated font from Inkscape or some other similar program if you wanted to use something a little bit more wild. Uh, 
a good old sans serif is always great. Just like before, I have very similar controls, mostly for the height. And I can also make it a whole or solid as well. And I can always change the text. You can also add a bevel if you want it to appear to be sculpted in. Of course, it's pretty small. You probably could not see it that well. So, yeah. So let's just say like your main. Then onto the bottom, then you make it a whole. So that means you can cut this out. If it's a solid, you can cut your main off inside of solid. Yes, if the text was set to whole, I can demonstrate that. So if I snap text to the box and rotate my view a little bit, because right now it's snapped to the face of the box. So I can choose a specific amount to lower it in. Let's say I'm going to do two millimeters, set that telling me it's two millimeters below the surface it was originally snapped to. Set it to a whole type. There's going to be a little flash as it disappears to compute. And now if I rotate over, you can see text is etched into the box. It's just a little challenging to see in this rendering engine, but it is cut into that square. See, you can kind of see the shading around it to show that text is cut into it. Another very powerful tool is actually this one, which just looks like a little weird worm. It is, in reality, the scribble tool. And if you edit the scribble, it can basically create anything. It's basically, I draw any random kind of line. It is creating a solid of exactly that weird snaky shape I just made. I can also choose to sketch in an area mode, which is what this little, this might mean nothing to anybody, but this looks exactly like, when I was a kid, they would sell like that Nickelodeon GAC substance in like yeah. a little container. It, looked, it, it looks exactly like that container is what that button looks like. And when you click and drag in this mode, it actually allows you to create like a weird, non-Euclidean shape and it's just kind of some random object in this case once it renders you can see it maybe not you can see it there we go huh that's weird I just deleted everything but you can see how it creates a shape based on what I'm doing as long as I connect the end that. You can also erase in the same way, just like doing the same shape. I can slice the shape out of it. And it's giving me these jagged edges because the processing speed's a little slow, so it's not giving me a perfectly accurate simulation of what it's making. And again, I can make a line. And maybe to just be fun, I'll connect these two things for the heck of it. And, but then I can also use this eraser tool to, uh, you know, add some visual interest. So there's a little dot, you know, like maybe this is like some kind of weird dinosaur. So there's its eye. <laughs> and then, <laughs> I don't know why I'm cracking myself up with this. And then if I click and drag, it's just like an eraser on a pencil. I can just shave away maybe a little bit of material here to create this weird handler or something. Um, and then if I like it, you know, there is also an undo button and a redo button. But if I like it, I can hit done. And now this object here exists in space. However, once you get to this point, the only thing you can change about the scribble is, of course, its object mode and the height that it is. But those are the basic tools. And of course, as you can see from this long list of pre-made solids, there are a ton of different shapes you can make. They're even organized in particular categories. So right now it's on basic shapes. There's like creatures, vehicles, machines, structures, scenery, electronics, all kinds of things that have been added into this library. Uh, feel free to explore all the various things that are there. 
for instance, here's a bunch of vehicle objects you can toss in if you're looking to make a cool vehicle of some sort. Um, design starters, just slightly more sophisticated shapes. Cool geometric shapes we have. Oh, they got helix, helices, which is fun. But anyway, back to standard shapes real quick. Um, one thing I'd like to know, the ruler tool. So let's say I want to know how long something is, where it is in space. It's telling me it's 15.6 millimeters tall. And I already have it selected, so I know that it's in fact correct. You can see it's just rounding to a different decimal point. Maybe I want to know what the edge of this square is. It's all in a weird position. Telling me, it's telling me all the dimensions, the main dimensions associated with this. So, I don't know, not that useful of a measurement tool. <laughs> it just just measures the overall geometric form. Um, workspace tool allows you to actually manipulate the workspace. Um, and I think you can also add a workspace if you want to have multi-areas to work. No, it's not multi-area stuff. I actually have no idea what the workplace tool is good for. It doesn't seem to be doing anything. Oh, it's, it's days. Anyway, those are the basic controls there. One thing that's also weird, and this may only be a useful thing if you have a lot of kids in your life, but, and in order to pan the view, I'm actually doing a middle click on my mouse. But you can see here, there are actually different modes you can view things in. Particularly of importance here is the Minecraft mode. So this is like a way you could like make Minecraft models and import them. It's just gonna take a second to process what this would look like in Minecraft. It's also operating slowly because I am using Zoom, which is also gonna be using a lot of the bandwidth available on my computer. So I'm sorry about the slow speed there. But there you go. Here's what it looks like in Minecraft. You can even like change the materiality of it as well. You can also switch it to legally unique, <laughs> legally distinct from Lego blocks. And it'll show you how to build your creation in Lego. Not Legos. They could be mega blocks. Oh, please. <laughs> Don't demean There's a child so by giving them mega blocks. So many. Sometimes you can create models that it won't be able to replicate. Obviously, there's there's like a, fun, a, a, a control here of like how detailed to make the model. So you can see it's on like low detail right now. So certain things like my little scribble may just look like a light blue blob of uh, Legos when it's done. But once it's done processing, you will see magical world of auto-generated Lego structures. I feel like I have to fan this thing. That's a little Tinkercad logo down there. That's a cute touch. Oh, well, something's building. Not bad. It even does like dummy blocks on the inside and 
save code. Well, that's fun. There you go. Simulate Lego build. Obviously, um, like anything, if you plan to be making it out of Lego, you probably would have designed it in such a way where Lego bricks would be easily able to swap into this. Obviously, something at an angle is not exactly what Lego bricks are good for. And so this mode just switches back to workspace mode. I haven't played too much with simulation mode, so I don't know what exactly gets into, but feel free to explore that. I have a feeling the sim labs actually more for the circuitry controls that they use. Uh, the circuitry designer you can use. But this is um, Tinkercad. Pretty straightforward, pretty fun tool. Any questions about working with Tinkercad from the gallery over here? No, no, okay, cool. Adam, you have anything you want to add about Tinkercad? Oh, Sean, the question. Yeah, I can hit the export button because now that there is something here, I can, you know, I can choose STL and it will make an export and it's in my download queue. There it is, an STL of what I just showed you. Yeah, and the STL is what you'll need for CNC, for cutting three dimensional CNC objects and for um, 3D printing. So now, Close this. Let's get back to the presentation. And I'm going to jump down past the demo here to talk about Fusion 360. So, like I said before, Fusion 360 is the big brother. And it is a little different than Tinkercad, but yeah, so it's. A lot different in terms of what it can do, the power that it has in order to manipulate objects and do a lot of things. So one of the big things to get right away is of course the data panel, which has you know, important file information to the application bar. Uh, that's just like any program. That's just, you can go ahead and open the chunk. Just go for it. It's not a movie. I can pause. Um, but anyway, uh, the bar at the top, of course, is just, you know, has your save, undo, redo, you know, various things, rename, and so forth. Uh, then, of course, you have the toolbar up top. Um, you can see a lot more tools than what we saw in Tinkercad. Um, because it is a solid modeling software, we have solid modeling tools. Um, so you can see we've got extrusion of solids, um, but then there's also surfacing tools, which is essentially how you make a hollow three-dimensional object. Um, the only difference is, of course, the differences between a solid body and a surface body are somewhat minimal, but a surface body is able to do more sophisticated geometric forms than a solid body. But because it is not solid, when you try to export it as an STL, it's ignored. So you, whenever you do your work with surfaces, you have to make sure once you're done creating those complex forms, you integrate them, make them into a solid body so that it can be exported later. That's kind of just a finicky thing with some advanced modeling techniques. Other advanced modeling techniques are the sheet metal mod modeling tools, which we won't get really into too much. And of course, tools to modify objects that are already in the space. There is an assembly mode as well, where you can take multiple parts you've created and actually unify them together into an assembly to simulate how they'll work together when they are made. Um, and then of course you can do things like measure and uh, insert images if you're trying to design something based off of a picture. Um, there is also, this right here is the current model being worked on. This is the file browser. This contains, um, depending on which mode you're in, it will contain the features to make one part. It will contain a list of the parts within the assembly. And in certain cases, the actions attached to those parts to make sure they're unified together in certain motions. 
Um, and it, like as Adam showed earlier, it can also hide the tool paths that can be used to machine an object. Uh, like before, and it's somewhat behind my Zoom viewport, but if I pull that down, yes. Not going to use this before, so yeah. are you tell me within this box? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's powerful enough where these screws, this wall, it looks like this manifold right here, this flywheel, those are separate parts that have been brought together and merged into an assembly for simulation of function. Um, that's what these programs are good for. So, like, you know, when you're designing something like this uh, presentation remote I'm using, you can actually model every single piece and then you can simulate how they fit together. To make sure you have the right fitments and allotments for tolerance, and you can go make it. It allows you to completely simulate something, like down to assembling it, so that you know it will go together instead of having case. That's powerful about a lot of this stuff. Uh, as I was mentioning, though, you can see right here. There's our little view cube. Same rules as Tinkercad. Works exactly the same. They just decided to throw the axes on there to be a little extra cool. Um, and then, of course, you have a uh, navigation menu and a timeline editing uh, menu as well. Um, Fusion 360 um, um, works on uh, basically allowing you to essentially always go back to change something. It's an iterative CAD tool. Um, we'll get into the definitions later, but it's basically parametric, meaning the dimensions are not static. So in Tinkercad, uh, that's what you call direct model. If I make a box that's an inch by inch by inch, well, that's what it is. In parametric, it's sophisticated enough where, sure, when I first model it, it's inch by inch by inch, but each of those dimensions in and of itself can actually be changed at any time and propagate those changes farther down in the model to create a dynamic model that can change with alterations you can figure out, oh, the gap here wasn't big enough. I go back, change a few dimensions, it updates automatically with those changes and shows me how that has affected the model. Um, it's a powerful thing and a frustrating thing. Like I said, I've been modeling parametrically for 20 years, and I have yet to do a model that doesn't have some problem when you're trying to work through things parametrically. I get close, but sometimes not close enough. So what we do next is, the way this works and the, the process by which you go through this is uh, tools like this have a sketch mode. You work in two dimensions, right? the profile of something. Those profiles are extruded or revolved or lofted or uh, a boundary object is created with them to create 3D parts that can be assembled into an assembly. This desk, which you might recognize from downstairs, it's a bunch of separate wood pieces that have all had their profiles drawn. They've all been extruded into a physical shape and they've been assembled together. It is then rendered, like I mentioned before, uh, rendering can be used. Like for instance, if I have a product idea, I want to try to get somebody excited about it, but I haven't built it. I can do a photorealistic rendering of it to make it look like it would in real life, as opposed to just what it looks like digitally. And then of course, uh, that can get people excited about it, do stuff with it. I would be embarrassed to tell you how long I've spent modeling insignificant things like bird feeders or the button on a touch screen uh, in order to make it look good in the rendering phase. Um, and then, of course, manufacture. Uh, Fusion 360 is great because it also, like a lot of other uh, tools of its ilk, have a manufacturing of uh, background to it as well, allowing you to actually do things like layout on your stock. Adam showed us earlier how he actually had his four handles laid out on stock. So he specified his stock size, specified where the models were, and then Fusion 360 can actually help you figuring out if your tool paths are gonna work. You're not gonna have any crashes or collisions with other parts when you try to cut out something. And again, for that desk, Fusion 360 was used to design and manufacture it. So, Next time you're downstairs, I believe it's by the library or is it up front? I forget where it is now. But I think it hangs out by the 
steps up to the patio. Yeah. The mirrored tap. Pottery area. Yeah, it's nearby there. Um, so, as this points out, um, Fusion 360 creates assumptions um, in other programs. Uh, I don't know if they're called assumptions in Fusion 360, but usually they're called uh, sketch relationships. Essentially what they are, as you can see, a circle is drawn here. A few lines have been drawn around the circle. And each of them have had automatic sketch relations attached to them that actually demonstrate what their relationships are to each other. These geometric relationships are part of the underpinning logic that allows parametric software to work. Because as you can imagine, if I could just change all those dimensions, well, that's great, but what's the angle of attack? How do they actually move around each other? How is a circular object going to interface with rectilinear objects? And that's where sketch relations come in. Fusion 360 will set them automatically. Uh, many other programs will as well. Uh, you can uh, also change the interface to not do it so much and you can add them later but you can see here this is a tangency symbol uh tangent for those who of us who remember geometry what does that mean what does it mean geometric so you've got a line coming off an object so it's touching it on one plane one point one. when it's in three dimensions it will be one line it's always a dimension less but um Tangency means that this line touches this circle tangently. So the point where that line ends is the only point that that line touches the circle. That's what tangency means. Only intersects a um, radius object in a single point. Uh, to see what looks like a capital T, uh, that is not a T, but it actually stands for perpendicular. What does perpendicular mean? Exactly 90 degrees. Uh, sometimes these programs also use the term normal too. It means the same thing. Um, and uh, the triangle there, I believe, is the symbol it's using for bisection, meaning this line, this third line here, is exactly in the middle of this uh, darker blue line. Again, these assumptions are what allow these models to be more robust and allow you to control a little bit more about how the shapes are interacting. If you remember before in Tinkercad, you just kind of draw anywhere and something would happen. In this case, Fusion 360 needs you to make a little bit more specific, um, have more specific ideas about how your geometry is going to interact in order to create the objects that are there. Keep in mind that uh, certain lines will change color. And like I mentioned, there are going to be codes for what each of these mean. And there are a lot more than this. There's parallel relationships. Uh, there can be um, equal relationships where lines are exactly the same length at all times. And like I said, there's always an assembly. So assemblies, if we think about it, uh, there is a sketch. Again, the sketch is turned into a three-dimensional object, and then a cluster of objects can be arranged into an assembly, uh, where you essentially create different constraints that essentially allow you to build with the different components you make to simulate how an object would go together. Um, there are even uh, more advanced constraints. Sometimes they're called mates, as it controls how the two objects mate together that even allow you to simulate things like rudimentary motion um, and other things, which is pretty darn cool. If I can, I might show you an example of something I made doing that. Um, but also you can have assemblies that include smaller assemblies as well, a sub-assembly. So I can actually create an assembly of assemblies. You can see in a desk like this, you can actually pre-build a cavity as one assembly and then import it into a master assembly of the overall desk. So you don't have to worry about handling 30 parts. You can instead just work on the 20 pieces that make up the main structure of the desk. Um, the thing is, whenever you start something completely from scratch, it's a new component. The first thing you'll be doing is making the component or part. Like how much in. Drawing in 3D. So this can be a little tricky to think about sometimes. 
Um, and that's because you're not going to learn it all at once. <laughs> it is very challenging. Um, like I said, I think it took me a few months before I really got used to how everything works. But even to this day, I learned something new about how 3D programs going to behave with my inputs. Like you saw even tonight, I'm like, okay, why did it do that? Sometimes you just get really good at troubleshooting what the program is doing based on what you're asking it to do. And something like Fusion 360 and other programs like it are incredibly complicated to the point where they can actually create errors very quickly. And that's just because the speed under, underpinning um, program that makes them is very sophisticated. So generally, what you're gonna be working with are making a basic sketch that is either extruded or revolved or other three-dimensional process being made into a three-dimensional object, which can be combined with other objects, which can be composed of different components or bodies, and then there's going to be all kinds of little things that you can do to essentially lock them, excuse me, into an assembly. Those assemblies can have joints and things, like I said, to actually create interaction with them, to create, to simulate what it would look like. And then there are even like incredibly sophisticated tools you can use, like the sheet metal tool, which actually allows you to model folded sheet metal forms and then click a button and it just flattens it out for you so you know exactly what you have to cut out to form the object on sheet metal. And then the many, many years you'll take playing with these tools to get used to them. You know, after 20 years, it's kind of fun to have that tool in your back pocket. So sketches are the backbone of your actual 3D objects. Um, typically, um, they, in these programs, they will essentially work at a one-to-one -one scale. As noted here, um, early on, um, even doing sketches by hand will always be one-to-one. -one. Typically, if you do any form of scaling, you know, uh, you would essentially apply that scale as you draw it or scale it afterwards. So for instance, um, if I wanted to actually model this as a big giant house, you know, I would make it that tall, maybe 15 feet high, 10 feet wide, 15 feet wide, however I was thinking of it. And then I can actually go in and use sketch tools to scale it to a more appropriate size. Or if I know I'm going to design it as a little desk piece, you know, I'll model it true with its true one-to-one -one dimensions. Knowing how to dimension and knowing what you're sketching and knowing what the end use of it is are very important to understanding how to streamline your workflow work in 3D design. Um, and what's also cool is um, those relationships can help you. You can actually see a few more symbols here. This is a uh, equal length. Uh, yeah, just a little, little symbol. Oh, those are the horizontal and vertical symbols? Oh, OK. Is it like an equal sign in an equal? Yeah, I don't yeah. really understand what that's. Yeah. The, the thing is, like, all of them use different symbols. I'm so used to the solid brick symbols, but I know that right, one right. is parallel. Parallel is just two little angled lines saying they're parallel to each other. But again, these sketch relationships are pretty cool because they can also propagate onto sketches in other directions, sketches on parallel planes near them, meaning that, that um, those sketches become child features to the first sketch's parent feature. And those dependencies also help uh, make your models faster to make and also make them faster to update. Now, extrusion is literally taking that 3D drawing and stretching it out. Now, extrudes work in building, creating mass. By actually, you can see in the first GIF, it's actually extruding outward and building the mass of the, this house shape. Whereas the second GIF shows an extruded cut. The same idea, but a shape being pulled through an object to subtract mass. Just like when we think about the solid versus whole material, take your All of these features, though, have to be based on a sketch that is related to geometry in the part. In the case of Revolve, same idea. It's a two-dimensional profile revolved or rotated around a central axis. In this case, creating almost like a toroid burger. 
if you will, is what it looks like to me. This looks like a bird. But um, you can also make it to where the revolve only goes 180 degrees, 90 degrees, or not a complete circle. But most revolves can create a complete circle. Um, and that actually allows you to create much more dynamic shapes. In some cases, just like if you're thinking about a wood turning project, Wood turning projects would be much easier to plan using revolves because that's how not only the part is going to move, but that's also how you're going to cut into it. It actually allows you to simulate something like that a lot more easily. Also, for any round parts, wheels, um, washers, if for some reason you're modeling a donut, a revolve might be a good place to start in order to make it. And again, it's the profile that, that you draw rotating around a central point. Any questions about those basic operations? What's what's seeming a little uh, out there? Nothing. Oh, okay. It's just a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if anything looks super confusing, though, definitely it's out there. Um, you can see here also listed, there are a few more sophisticated tools. We're not going to get into those today. They all represent different, sophisticated ways of modeling that actually use multiple sketches to create certain forms. Um, but <laughs> we're not going to get that far into this. Um, what you can also do is combine objects. So remember the Boolean operators that we covered in 2D design? Well, it also works in 3D design. As you can see in that GIF, uh, creating a simple figure jointed pattern can be as easy as taking your first body with a finger joint pattern, moving them together, and subtracting the intersecting uh, material away to create a perfectly modeled finger joint. That can be very helpful if, again, designing furniture, boxes, other types of joinery. Boolean can be incredibly powerful. Um, it does require you to always consider that additional level of planning. In order to make this joint Effectively, I have to consider the thickness of the material I'm going to be using, the tools that might cut it out, what those tools might need by way of clearance in order to effectively cut the shapes I'm asking them to cut. For a little uh, case study here, if we were to look at this red shape in the upper left-hand corner, if I were to cut that out on the laser cutter, that would be pretty simple, right? We would get those sharp corners pretty easy. But if we think about cutting it out on a CNC router, would it be able to cut that shape as it's drawn right now? What do you think? It has a little, essentially a little end mill, which is like a really fancy drill bit that can cut sideways as well as up and down. You gotta remember, as that tool is gonna go into that little gap there, it's round, but it's trying to cut a sharp edge thing. So when you do joinery and you know you're going to be using the Shoko or the other CNC machine, you're going to have to put relief cuts in there so the tool actually can get in there and cut enough space for the adjoining joint to actually fit into that space. So in that case, I have to leave room for the tool to do its complete cut path. So when you say that, so you say so you want to choose to go with it or not. Basically, yeah, what, what, we, what you typically do is do the, uh, what's called a dog bone. I would add a little extra area for the drill, uh, for the uh, end mill to go up and below on each side so that it goes to the full back, goes up a little bit, goes down a little bit extra, then comes back out. That way, there's nothing in the corners to block the other piece of material getting right up against the back of your tent. Okay, now after all that material, we're going to put new advanced ideas into it. So again, with componentry, um, you can actually um, bring things together, but you can also generate parts lists so that you remember everything you need to create an assembly. Essentially create a shopping list of either what you have to make or you have to get in order to uh, build something that you've modeled. Another thing, sketch constraints. Um, you, the goal is, especially with the parametric software like Fusion 360, this is like an annoying thing to come from the world of engineering. And that is, 
you want your sketches A to be fully defined. That is, there are zero degrees of freedom. How do we test for degrees of freedom? Well, when we make a sketch, the lines when we first draw them are not defined. They're actually just kind of like there in space. We want them to be this dark black color. Usually when you first draw them, they're blue. And so when you turn them into this full black color, they are fully defined. And what that means is if I were to just randomly click on this endpoint and try to drag it, it can't move because the software knows, uh, uh there's no way this point could move based on the constraints you've added. Additionally, you want to use as few dimensions as possible to define sketch. That's just a rule of thumb. It's not something that has to be used all the time, but it helps to make the sketches more streamlined and less confusing for you to come back to later. Um, as you can see here, they've only had to measure the width because this line is constrained properly. And then they only measured this once and then patterned that similar length down for the other parts. So they're all using this same uh, uh, separation number to create the different subdivisions. And additionally, they have the full length and full width set right there. And you can see how they've, this is where the actual subdivision pattern happens on this side. It's unfortunate that they've blocked it with that menu though. <laughs> you have to know how much space. So I'll, I, maybe I'll show you something. I'm actually designing something that has a bunch of different joints, and I have to specify what my gap tolerance is. And so I actually draw this. I'll draw exactly this shape, and then I create a secondary sketch powered by certain dimensions that I set earlier in the sketch to add gaps here so that I know after it's cut out, I have enough wiggle room for A glue to fit in the joint, and B, so that it'll actually slide together, even if there are slight variations in the wood. That kind of knowledge just comes from experience. It's not necessarily something the program can do for you. Good question. And so um, a lot of these parameters help to define everything that works in your sketches. So you can see here, We've got, I'm gonna move my viewport here. You can see that in here, there's a list of parameters showing the different uh, actual values these things have. But what's also cool is certain things can be linked via equations. This is kind of the uh, elements of parametric design because these subsequent dimensions, which control something else in this uh, object are actually based on the first dimension here, height of the doghouse called dog height. You can see here that this dimension D4 is actually taking dog width, which is eight inches, and it looks like multiplying it by three to get its value, meaning that it is actually dependent on whatever dog width is set to. So that if I go in and change the parameter of dog width, dog width and this subsequent dimension will change to update with that alteration. This is what you were talking about earlier on when you were talking about making the change in the basket to change the mm -hmm. That's what this is. That's one of them, yep. Yep, it's one of the ways you can do that. Right, excellent, you clicked off. And then of course, like I mentioned before, you can actually have joints that allow you to define motions. These are special types of relationships that allow you to show how, for instance, this little tab should stay in this slot and can only travel to one side of it to the back of it. And it sounds really complicated, but actually a lot of these, it, as long as you've drawn the parts correctly, a lot of these things actually work insanely easy. 
you know, they usually can recognize, oh, okay, you've got this weird slot. Yeah, you want it to stay in there? Cool. And it'll just like figure that out for you in a lot of instances. Although when you get real wacky, let's say, let's say this was a, a slot that also like went at a 90 degree angle and then back more, that gets more sophisticated and then you have to do special stuff to get it to know that. Um, and then you can even do patterns across things. Now, there are, of course, straightforward patterns. You can take like one feature and have it patterned in the length and width across a flat plane or on a round surface. In this case, you can actually pattern something across a really dynamic spline curve like this. And it will equally space each one of those features along this like snake-like tube thing. And that's a really awesome thing is that if you have to sit there and measure each one out. You're basically taking one thing you did, making sure that worked, and then patterning it all around, meaning that if you change that one individual seed of the pattern, all of them change. And here's where we get into kind of the philosophy behind certain CAD programs. So generative design is still a fairly new space in the CAD world. So as you can see from this example of this kind of sophisticated bracket, the one all the way to the left would be traditionally one that somebody might make if you went to a metal worker or a welder and said, okay, I have this tube and it's got to connect to all these points. They would make something like that. And you can see these really nice thick weldman joints. The one next to it is basically you take all the same linkage points that you need to connect and you also tell it there's a constraint on the top and bottom. And then the software uses an algorithm, in fact, the same algorithm that's used to uh, simulate bone growth. And it will simulate what the proper structure will be to support all those parameters. And it'll come up with something kind of freaky and organic looking like that. It works. It, yeah, it, it'll work if you use whatever preset material you've added on there. Because you can actually tell it, like, you know, as long as you know the operating constraints. So typically you'd have to say, like, for each one of these nodes, which direction is it getting pulled and how much force on average is pulled and pulling on it. And it will generate something that will withstand the force values. Um, yeah, I, I haven't seen, uh, it's, a, it's a funny thing because it's really cool. I haven't seen a lot of applications for it, actually. Um, I mean, I first saw this stuff like 10 years ago. And it seemed pretty cool, but it hasn't really caught on because you essentially have to trust the computer to always be right about it. Whereas, like, it's a hell of a lot easier just to have somebody weld a bunch of fins to a pipe and call it a day. Whereas uh, the second version that you see there, and even the third version, how would you name it? You need, like, a 3D printer, and then also you're imparting different types of failure modes because it's a 3D printed object versus a solid plate metal object. And, you know, the... 3D printing technology just isn't there yet, but it's close. Um, and then parametric. So this is actually, this is a little misleading with some of this design. Like, yes, parametric design do, is for creating those patterns, but Fusion 360 is a parametric software. Parametric design refers to having uh, CAD modeling where the dimensions are not set in stone. They are not perfectly locked. They are actually mutable meaning that through specific geometric and algorithmic relationships, those dimensions will change and alter based on preset constraints that you've added. It allows you to do really cool stuff like creating certain organic patterns or even certain really cool lattice structures. Um, a lot of it is like doing a design pattern, uh, particularly the program Grasshopper, which is a plugin for Rhinoceros, which is a 3D program, has become very, very um, popular over the past few years, actually. I was just speaking with a design firm that likes to use it to make um, hand grip patterns on the products that they design. It's pretty cool. The opposite of parametric design that we experience in Fusion 360 is what we see in Tinkercad, which is called direct modeling. SolidWorks, Fusion 360, Autodesk Inventor, all of them use parametric design. Pretty much everybody else, um, you know, with a few exceptions, use direct modeling. That is, I do something to something. And that's it. I can't go back. What's cool about parametric design is you, you can always go back right to the beginning because every single time you're viewing the model, it's regenerated by the software up to that point. 
And then, of course, simulation. So like I said, there are, of course, motion simulations like the good assemblies. In it also with sophisticated CAD software, you can do failure mode analysis as well. Uh, in these upper, uh, these ones that have all the rainbow patterns on it, those show how stress is being transferred through a solid body. And they can show you like where is going to be the biggest point of failure. Uh, depending on how they've set the scale, you know, it could be blue is high or red is high. I can't see close enough to know for sure, but it'll basically show you like where is going to be the point of failure for this object. You can also simulate flow, which is what this lower one down here, the kind of weird S tube here is doing. It's actually demonstrating how is, you know, whatever fluid flowing through that is going to move through this object. So you can see we've got high pressure and then basically we've got low pressure going into this, um, oh God, what are these things called? Basically, this is a pressure release valve. It's a, it's a way to relieve pressure in the system without actually using a pump or any kind of electronics because you just have wildly increased the diameter of the tube it's passing through. So you get high pressure, low pressure again, and then it's repressurized to the other side. Uh, just an interesting thing. Um, and then that's kind of the long and short of a lot of what we get into with CAD modeling. The venturi, the venturi effect, is that a- The venturi effect, effect. yeah, there's like a- Name of that. Yeah, there's like a special engineering term for it too. Um, a few things I would like to cover when it comes to 3D modeling. It's really, really, really easy to lose your sense of scale when you're modeling. So the number one thing I always recommend to people getting started, get a good ruler, at least a ruler you trust. This is just one I happen to like quite a bit. Um, a simple ruler will go a long way because a lot of times you'll be saying to yourself like, oh yeah, like, you know, three quarters of an inch, that's probably good enough for my finger. Like, oh, actually it's not, you know? It's just good to have something around to tell you physically how large something may be because as you can imagine, when it's on the screen here in the room, it looks gigantic. On your screen, you're zooming in and out, you kind of lose the fact that, oh, it's actually 10 millimeters, it's only this big. So it's always good to have a good ruler on, on your body. Other things that might also be helpful, especially if you're going to be, uh, let's say you want to create a replacement part for something or analyze how something is put together, it's always good to have a really nice set of calipers. Now, these are insanely expensive calipers. Uh, you don't have to go out and get something like this. Uh, something like Lowe's or Home Depot, you can get a relatively decent set of calipers for like 15, 20 bucks. Calipers are great because, especially digital ones, can easily go between inches and millimeter modes. And I can get very, very accurate measurements like this goes um, inches down to four decimal places and millimeters down to two, which is very, very small. I can easily measure the width of my hair on this. And um, it allows me to get very, very accurate dimensions, especially if like, okay, I want to know the size and width of the opening of this slot. Basically set my calipers to that opening. Okay, it's 0. 0.667 inches. And I know when I go to model it, I know something 667 wide will fit into this slot. Um, you know, if anybody, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with calipers at all, but not only these are the internal measurement jaws, these are the external measurement jaws, and this is your depth measurement probe. And if you're fancy like me, you get an actual <laughs> depth probe uh, guard to also allow it to be more stable when you take a depth measurement. So you can see how that increases the book of it, so it's more stable to measure. Another helpful thing in doing a lot of these tasks, sounds funny, but uh, I still swear by it, even having a very simple right angle uh, reference. If you're measuring something that's quite round, I can actually put this on here and already I'm measuring tangent point on this side to this side. I know where it's touching and I can easily measure out how far that is touching on here using some of my other measurement tools to help me. Uh, this is just a sensitive one that also doubles as a uh, uh, center finder on a piece of wood. But you know, obviously you get some that are like a triangle or some that have other functions to them. I do highly recommend it um, for certain operations, especially if you want to get into like uh, design furniture or other products and stuff like that.
this week focusing on software, so Tinkercad, Orafusion, and Orafusion, um, but starting with Tinkercad and just mess around and drag some shapes out like Tom is doing, make some shapes. Um, and then you can try Fusion 360. These are suggested because they are both free um, and Fusion is very fully featured, super powerful, and free for hobbyist use. Um, so a good place to get your feet wet. Um, Another good, um, very easy to use CAD software is SketchUp as well. That's a really easy one that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, it just has, it works a little bit differently, but very similar to actually what we just showed you in Fusion, but just much more user friendly. But uh, being able to follow some tutorials, there's lots of good tutorials for mm. both these programs, and I will be here on Sunday at noon as usual. And, and I'm here every Wednesday at 6 to 9, so I can also help you out with your CAD woes. Sit with you and extrude things, cut <laughs> things all day long. Uh, also, as a suggested um, project, you can you can just try creating a simple doghouse and, and build that out. Just see if you can figure out how to do it. Again, more than one way to skin a cat on this particular design. Well, uh, too, too, too close. <laughs> but that was too far. Okay, <laughs> now, I do my millimeter jokes. Everybody's quiet. But anyway. <laughs>